This, my friends, is really hardcore. So we're back in action. We're out here on a customer's home and they have uh, uh, this room that we're standing in is an addition. It's a back porch addition and they have a light in just inside the door here that controls two lights. It controls this light up above our head and it also controls the outdoor light that I'm getting ready to show you. Well, when I took the cover off the switch plate, I found out that there were only two independent black wires coming into the switch box. No jackets, no neutrals, no grounds, no nothing. So I knew something was funny going on. Something, something funny was going on. So upon further investigation, I pulled down this light. There's only one wire. I pulled down the light outside. There's only one wire. And then I pulled out the receptacle down beneath and found out that it was somehow giving it power by tugging on it. Upon further inspection, we're getting ready to go out and show you something cool right here. All right, so the switch is just through that wall right there. And the receptacle that we took apart was down there, which is somehow giving it power. Up in that light, there is only one wire. And then out here, in this light, there's only one wire. But if you look over here in the corner, when I got here, after doing all this inspecting, there was a rag stuffed in here. And I stuffed it in. It was tighter than that. I stuffed it back in. Okay? And then I pulled all this insulation out. And if you look very closely, this looks like a half of a light box. So before they built this addition, that was the back porch. That was the back door. This is the light box. They moved it over to here. And if you look down in there, I hope you guys can see it. There is a yellow power bundle that they just shoved back in there. So I'm hoping that is all of our switch legs. We can pull it out and refeed it properly. And I'll get you some more uh, shots as we go. Let's see if I can go ahead and record it as I pull it out. should have there's two wires three good I have three okay so that's one of the switch legs going to the light up above one of the switch legs is coming right here to this light right here and one of them is acting as the switch leg so this one's coming over here this one's going up to that light over in the room and this one's coming down from the switch box awesome so all we got to do refeed this properly um, get it set up with a proper power coming up from that bottom lower box then feed this switch box and then connect to this somehow so i'll have to put a junction box right here for this switch leg but i should be able to properly feed it from that switch down below and offer him the solution that he needs let's get to it all right so i went ahead and cut the switch box out because i'm going to make it a two gang anyways and this is what i found those are the two wires that i found independently coming into that switch box and sure enough back in the wall they had cut the jacket back left the neutral um unspliced and just shoved it in the back of the wall what we've done is the old line to tape on we use the old switch leg to tape on i pulled two switch legs up one of them is going to go to the light inside i have to set a j box here the other one is just going to extend all the way to this light. Then when we come inside, I pulled up new power here, and then I've got the two switch legs right here. All right, so just as we suspected, this wire is coming from right there. So we're going to pull our new switch leg in, in through here, and bring it into this box properly. Maybe even put a new box in here. As I got to pull in on this, one of the neutrals came out. And this is the type of stuff and reason why you never bury stuff in the wall. So you mean to tell me you never put a splice in the wall? It's because this neutral would have came loose, would have dropped the neutral, and then they would have never known where that splice was at. Now, it may seem tempting when you come into a situation like this and you know you're refeeding it to just start demoing wire. But always, at all costs, use the old wire to pull your new one in. This looks like it's free-flowing, but if you look back in there... It's kind of tight. There may be another stud right here. And the only way I'm really going to get this through with any ease is to attach on the old one and to pull it through. And sure enough, it was a bear to get in there. I'm not sure I would have been able to get it in there without really fighting it had I not taped it on and pulled it through. All right, y'all, it is that time again. We are going to do our code of the week. 
And this week we're going to be memorizing 250.66, and that's going to be for the size of grounding electroconductors. So whether you're wanting to know how large of a conductor you need to go to that footing ground or to that water pipe or to that ground rod, you can jump right here in 250.66. And if you just need to know the size of a different type of electrode or a different scenario, you can use table 250.66. Let's get to it. So we brought all of our new wires into the box, and I thought that this would be a great time to talk about this code article right here. And what this says is that, that you're required to have a neutral inside of a switch box. But is that what it really says? Are you really required to have the neutral? Let's go ahead and take a look at it now. What the code is wanting us to do is provide a neutral for these new electronic switches, electronic dimmers, all these different things that may require a neutral. The problem is, is if they don't have one in the box, often people who don't understand the dangers will uh, ride that neutral current out on a bare ground, right? And then we've got problems with objectionable current. But I want you guys to know the code. Don't just do things because people tell you to do them. I want you to know the code, then you can make the call for yourself. Yeah. So do all switch boxes require neutrals? The answer is no, because there are points right here. We find ourselves in 404.2C. And we find ourselves right there. And what it states is, is that you're required to have a neutral inside the box. And it tells you why you're supposed to do it unless you hit any of the following points. And there's five different points here. And if you hit any of these points, you're not required to have the neutral in the box. The first one being where the conductors enter the box or switch. Raceway, provide a, a raceway where it's large enough to fit that conductor if you can do it later. So let's say I ran a piece of three quarter and I ran it over to a switch box and I didn't want to pull the neutral that day for whatever. And I've only got four wires in that pipe and it allows, you know, 13. So legally I can fit that neutral later and I can fish it later with the fish tape, whether it's easy or hard, the code doesn't care. Okay. But it's saying that it's possible. So if it's possible through a raceway or a conduit, a possible to fish a wire in and the pipe fill is not going to be affected by me adding that neutral conductor, then I don't have to fish it in today. I can just fish over the switch legs, leave it alone. And if somebody else wants to fish in a neutral later, they can do it. The second point here is if the box or enclosure is accessible without damaging the finishing surface. So what it's staying here is that if I can fish a wire there later then I, without damaging the surface, then I don't have to have a neutral inside that box. Well, let me ask you a question. If I'm doing a rewire on a house and I can fish a wire there one time, can I fish a wire there again? And the answer is yes. Now, if you run into a scenario where you have a two-story building, okay, and you're not going to be able to access it above or below, because remember, below counts too. If I can get in the crawl space and fish it up without damaging the outer surface, and if you're a good electrician, you can fish wires just about anywhere anywhere as long as it's physically possible without tearing the house up or messing with the finished you know surface sometimes you got to modify it a little bit but for the most part we can get a wire there right even if we got to take the box out of the wall or whatever all right so here's the score guys the answer is no you do not have to put a neutral inside of every box now is it practical to yes should we probably do it yes are we required to by code no as long as you can hit any one of these five points i gave you the most common ones that you're going to run into today you can read the other ones you'll find yourself in 404.2 see this my friends is really hardcore this my friends is really hardcore is really hardcore all right y'all this is something you thought you'd never see so our local electrical supply house and lowe's are out of 15 amp tamper resistant receptacles i had to spend five dollars on this one outlet to get this job done Hey y'all, good morning. So we're getting ready to head down in the crawl space. And I figured it would be a great time to talk about this code right here. And when you are wiring underneath of a crawl space or an open basement, there are going to be some codes there. All right, today we're going to look at the question, can I staple Romex right to the bottom of the stud? And the short answer is no, but yes. You guys know how the NEC is. So here we go. If we're dealing with 14 gauge, 15 amp wire, 12 gauge, 20 amp wire, or 10 gauge 30 amp wire the answer is no never 
And what we're talking about here is if you're in a crawl space or in an unfinished basement, you are never allowed to staple those smaller wires right to the bottom of the stud. You're required to drill it out. There is an exception, however, when we get over in 334.15C. And what this is going to be is when we're dealing with cables that are 6'2 and larger or 8'3 and larger, the NEC actually allows us to staple those directly to the bottom of the stud. So we still have to follow all the other codes, right? Subject of physical damage, all of these other things, but you can legally staple it right to the bottom of the stud. Where this really comes in handy is when you're dealing with large wire, like 200 amp SER or 100 amp SER. You can staple that thing or strap it right to the bottom of the stud. And what this allows you to do is save a lot of time in drilling, a lot of time in you know hassle, struggling to get that wire in, as long as it's not subject to physical damage and it is 6'2 and larger or 8'3 and larger, you're allowed to staple Romex right to the bottom the stud. One thing I love about our state is they've made an exception to this rule that if the crawl space is 46, I think it's 46 or 48 inches or less, you can actually staple all wire directly to the bottom of the stud. We're going to go ahead and suit up and get ready for war. So we found an existing receptacle hole. There's a little receptacle just up above this to find our stud plate. Because if you notice here, it's just wood. I mean, you don't know where that upper stud plate is. But thankfully, if you look down through here, there's some plumbing and some different things poking up through that stud plate. So that'll at least let you know you're in the stud plate. And I knew that outlet was about a foot over from my box. So I drilled up right there and sure enough, it went straight up. We were able to pull it right up so with that being said now my next outlet is 28 inches over that way and then hopefully i'll be able to drill up in the stud plate again and have the same level of success What code cycle did AFCI protection get introduced? Was it 2002, 1999, 1993, or 2008? What do you think? It was B, 1999. In the great United States, AFCI protection was first introduced in the 1999 code cycle with a mandatory effective date of January 1st, 2002 for bedrooms. And because I know you guys are totally obsessed with all things Canada and you're not going to be able to go to sleep tonight unless you hear when it was adopted in Canada, it was actually adopted in their 2002 code cycle. All right, y'all, we're going to round this week out with the tool review of the week. This week, we are reviewing the Milwaukee M18 2727-21HD 16-inch chainsaw. This thing will take up to 150 cuts per charge, and it says that it's faster than gas, but we're about to find out about that. One thing, when you get it out of the box, of course, everything that we get from Milwaukee always just feels good. Inside of the box, you're going to have your instruction manuals. You're also going to have your 12 amp hour battery, which we're going to show you that here in just a little bit. And when we get it out, the thing does feel stout. So it has a nice chain guard on it and we're getting ready to take some action shots. The only thing I didn't like about this thing is that it did not come with chain oil. If a man dumps $500 on a brand new chainsaw, come off with a dollar's worth of chain oil, Milwaukee. They did have a viewer for the chain oil, so you could see it, but it does feel pretty stout in your hands. So let's go ahead and look at this 12 amp hour battery. I got the boy with me. He's showing it off for you. It's huge. It's massive. It just feels like raw power in your hands but it does add quite a bit of weight to the party. You also have your chain break, so if you if it starts to buck back on you, and ultimately it feels like a pretty rock solid chainsaw. Now this first cut that I'm showing, this is probably a 10 to maybe 13 inch 
Um, it is a softwood, although this uh, chainsaw does claim to cut hardwoods, but I'm shooting this one in real time. So if you do have this chainsaw, I would say to be patient because this is actually a softwood tree and this has taken quite a bit of time to cut through it, probably three times the time it would to take to do with a gas power chainsaw. So when you're using this, make sure that you have some time on your hands. Now this one I've sped up 350% and you can still see how long it takes to cut through this soft wood, but ultimately it felt pretty good in my hand. Now, back in the backyard, we went ahead and cut down some limbs. Feels pretty good. Took a few minutes there to cut it down, but I felt like it cut through with no problem. As far as cutting those limbs up, didn't take just a minute. So I feel like for any light work that you, that you are going to be doing around the house, this thing will probably pay off in the long run. One thing I do love about it is that you don't have to worry about mixing gas, keeping up with that, dealing with the fumes and the smells. But one thing that we have to ask ourselves, is this really going to replace the feeling that you get when you hold a gas chainsaw and hear that thing right? Probably not. Sorry, Milwaukee. 